But we're ready to do the, uh, God, he got me all flustered here. <laughs> <laughs> Not at a loss for words, usually. Uh, we're doing Matthew 24, is knocking at your door. Jesus has just got done tearing the established church and religious people to pieces. And now we go into Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is known by many as the doomsday, because you're going to run into the abomination of desolation and earthquakes and plagues and all this kind of stuff here. But you're going to look at it as you have learned to see things here mystically, spiritually, metaphysically, if you would. Let's take a look at the very first verse in Matthew 24, and it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus went out and departed from the temple means that this is you and me when we are outside of Christ consciousness, when Jesus departs from the temple within us. Don't look at this literally. You know, for God's sake, don't look at this as a storybook. Begin, and I'm sure that those of you have come here long enough to understand that you've, you've got a Bible in your hand, and the Bible is a book of symbols, it's a book of parables, it's a book of allegory, a book of numerology. It was an interesting thing. I was watching, I had to switch on, there was a Christian television fellow on there yesterday, and this, I, you all would have gotten a big kick out of this. He says, I know that everything in here is literal. Well, why wouldn't it be a thousand years? Why can't that be literal? Well, you see other places God used literal numbers, 153, 1260, so then why isn't a thousand years literal? I, you wish you had been there to see that one. That's a beaut. <laughs> but you weren't. <laughs> But what happens to disciples who claim Jesus Christ as Lord when Jesus is outside of the temple? What do they come to show him? Buildings. We become then so impressed with the traditions of religion and evangelists and structures when Jesus is not active in the temple, the first thing that we will do is we become interested in the things outside the temple. We become interested in church things. We become interested in religious things. We become interested in all of the things that we see and all of the things that other people tell us because he's not inside. There's an interesting thing when we talk about the temple. Okay. And, you, and when you look at the words of Jesus Christ and you see this once again, you have to start saying to yourself, my goodness, you know, do I ever want to really bring myself to experience a big church again? If, if I get enamored by churches, if I get enamored by religious institutions, am I really then in line with Jesus Christ or am I? He and I totally on different wavelengths. Look what I'm telling you. Look at page 50 in the New Testament in the little Bible. The rest of you go to the book of Mark and come to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Now, when you come in here on Tuesday nights and we talk about entering into the temple, say, not into this building, into this room in this shopping center, we talk about entering into the temple, entering into that divine temple, your structure, that which is you. Look what Jesus says in Mark chapter 14. Okay. Verse 58. This is witnesses who had heard him talking about Jesus. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. This is what they, Jesus Christ is saying, I will destroy the structures that are built by religion. In other words, what that means is there will come a time, and it has come, when you will no longer be awestruck, you will no longer have the respect, you will no longer be bowing down to these structures that you used to because they have been destroyed by another, more bigger, beautiful, divine temple which has been created without hands inside of you. So all of that stuff that is religious, all of a sudden becomes irrelevant because the only thing that becomes relevant is this holy temple. It's the only temple that exists, and that's what Jesus is talking about. When the Christ consciousness comes upon man, the religious consciousness will be destroyed, and the new consciousness that is made without the interference of man will be structured, and that's what happens inside of you. Okay? 
the temple made without hands. So what is the instructions to you about buildings? What is the instructions to you about religion? All religion. The important, beautiful things, the, the things you see on, re, on, on Christian television and all, and other ch television. Matthew, Matthew 24 again, page 25 in the little Bible. Matthew 24. And take a look here at verse 2. Jesus Christ said, see ye not all these things? It's a question. See? What's he say? What did Jesus just say? See ye not all of these things. In other words, Jesus Christ is telling you right here, I told you not to be impressed with these large and physically beautiful aspects of religion. Don't look at that. Don't let that be important to you. Look what he says here. Truly I say to you, there shall not be one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Can you imagine, listen what he is saying as you look at the Gothic cathedrals all over the world and the dedication of these magnificent buildings of all types and all sizes and everybody is totally enamored with them and he says, I told you don't look at that stuff. Don't be impressed by that. Make it be meaningless to you. Because it is going to come a day when all of that stuff comes crashing down. See ye not all of these things. Now stones on a higher level are spiritual building block. That's why all of God's things are built with stone. And the reason is because they're not impressionable. You can't push anything into stone. It holds its center. It holds its core. It's undisturbed, see. But stones on the lower aspect of consciousness are are those man's imitations. They try, they, they look impressive, they seem beautiful, they seem holy, see, but they're man's design, and they'll fall in the heap as so much is happening now. All over the world. And because even though people are staggering in these places like zombies, they're sitting there still groping, trying to find ways of living, trying to find a purpose for their life. And so what do they do? Well, they stay with their religion, but actually they seek out teachers now. They seek out a John Bradshaw. See? So that way they can go to their traditional church and go through the motions, but actually get the truth of life from a guy named John Bradshaw so nobody can yell at them because they're not going to a religious person. See? Or they'll go to a psychologist or they'll, they'll go to meetings about you know, how to overcome stress or whatever. It's the same thing. They're trying to find outside from secular people that which they can find inside their church. And that's why there's such a tremendous outpouring all over the place of teachers teaching people, counseling people, sharing with people, because people don't know what to do, and they're afraid to, to go to some place where it may have a religious connotation to it. So they stay in the church, they sit there, they don't pay any attention to it, they throw their money in, they keep with their traditions, but they're going and getting their conscious material from people on the outside. Secular people. And here, what man then rejects is that stone as it says, the stone that the builders rejected turned out to be the most important of all, the pineal gland of the brain. And we continue to get people writing, oh, send me this thing from Dr. Wilson. Send me this thing from Dr. Wilson. Uh, get me the thing in from the New York Times. The New York Times, as you know, a few weeks ago put out an article, Dr. Wilson has discovered that the pineal gland secretes melatonin and it kills cancer cells and strengthens the immune system. Everybody wants to know about that now. Krishna said it 6,000 years ago. Buddha said it 3,000 years ago. Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. It went over everybody's head because religion said don't pay any attention to it. Stay away from it. But now they can't say that to Dr. Wilson. What does Dr. Wilson care if some religion says stay away? He could care less. See? He said it does. They can't say it doesn't. But when you take it and, and you understand what's being said here, the pineal gland secretes melatonin and it kills cancer. Jesus says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Melatonin is a skin lightener. And he says, physician, heal yourself. So all of a sudden, Jesus is being proved right, not by the preachers and the evangelists and the religious teachers, being proved right by science. Christians being proved right by science. That's what has to happen. I was talking to somebody yesterday and I said, what has to happen is now is what's happening in the universe. There is a oneness developing between God and science. God and science are becoming one. You know why? 
Because if you can't be proved, it ain't so. If it cannot be proved, it ain't so. There is no way that anybody can heal you by osmosis. Something has to happen in your body for healing to take place. The electric circuitry, the chromosomes, the hormones, the glands, something has to do something or it can't happen. There has to be an explanation for everything. If there's no explanation, it ain't. It's like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, what is not has never been and never will be. What is has always been and always will be. See? And that's what's happening, and that's what's so exciting today when you see all these things coming out. Dean Ornish, who's doing these things about healing heart disease through meditation, and, 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 all, and, and then Dr. Wilson, and all of this stuff is all coming out. Why? Because science is proving God. And, and religion is still saying, have faith. In what? Have faith in what? But here, you can have faith in Dr. Wilson. It's because Dr. Wilson wouldn't lie. But, and do you know the funny thing? People will have. They won't read a book by Krishna because the religion said don't do it. They wouldn't read a book by Buddha because religion said to do, do it. Jesus Christ, they don't even know what he says because everybody says he said something different. So they got Dr. Wilson now. The Bible according to Dr. Wilson. So they'll all meditate and this will happen because Dr. Wilson said so. However, who cares? Whatever, as long as it, as long as it works. So the stones of religion fall. But I want to show you something now in, on page 215 in, in the New Testament, in the Little Bible, 1 Peter, okay? 1 Peter and chapter 2. Page 215 in your Little Bible. Here is, here's this thing that Dr. Wilson talks about, the pineal gland of the brain. You see, come on with me a minute. When, According to the ancients, when the pineal gland of your brain is unregenerated, when it's not stimulated by meditation, it is a sandy consistency. When it is stimulated by meditation, it becomes like a small stone. Okay. And then triggers off and sends off the, the different impulses through your body. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner. Do you know something? There's only one building on the face of the earth in which the stone is head of the corner. You know what that building is? Pyramid. That's right. That's a pyramid, and that's exactly what the Bible's talking about. There is only one building where the stone is made the head of the of the corner. It's a pyramid, and if you look on the back of your one dollar bill, you'll see it. And that is the stone which represents in all antiquity the pineal gland of the brain which the builders, the religionists, have rejected. And that is the one, according to your Bible, which has turned out to be the most important one of all. Does it say that in your book? But what is it? It is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to them. Why? Because they call it a cult. Go anywhere you want, up and down this highway, you go knocking any door in any of these churches, and you tell them you're messing around with this, and they'll tell you, look out, you're getting into cult stuff. It's th they're offended by it, scared to death of this. And that's what the Bible's saying. This stone, the pineal gland of the brain, which Jacob called pineal, which Jesus called the single eye, which Dr. Wilson says heals, can't, cures cancer, this stone which you stimulate in your meditation turns out to be the most important stone of the... And do you know, this is the stone that Jesus Christ was talking about when he said, Thou art Petros. Petros, Peter means small stone. Thou art Petros, it is a small stone upon which I will build my church because when that stone, that pineal gland becomes active, it opens up the right hemisphere of the brain and sends healing and love and reconstruction throughout all humanity. The stone which the builders of religion have rejected turns out to be the most important of all. That's why it is so important to come here and meditate. I don't, I, I, I can't understand for the life of me how people would not come for their self, for little minute cancer cells that might be starting in your body. Dr. Wilson said it, the melatonin will flow and wash them away. For your children, 
Why does your children have to go through the same crap that you've gone through? Bring them here. I don't care if they fall asleep on the floor. Bring them. Let them be exposed to the vibrations. You know, I don't know if I'll live to see it, but one day, as you're starting to see in the newspaper, it'll blast all over the place that if people practice this and bring this electrical energy up within themselves and stimulate this pineal gland, they'll be able to heal diseases and all of this kind of stuff. Doggone it, it's exactly 100% true. It's what Jesus taught. Why aren't there people pouring on this and, and doing it? Oh, my God, it inconveniences me. I have to go out for an hour. If you knew, if you knew you had a cancer cell starting in your body and you had to inconvenience yourself and sit on the floor for an hour, you know what you'd do? You'd sit on the floor for three weeks. <laughs> but there it is, and it works, and it's scientific. It's a scientific that's it. I am not interested in a religion that is outside of nature and cannot be explained and proved by science. Because everything that is in the Bible, everything that is in the ancient, can and will be explained by science. More and more of it. More and more of it. Where am I here? Matthew 24, okay? Page 25. Matthew 24, page 25. Verse 3. Here's Jesus outside as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. He's outside of the dot done yelling at religion and that's all over with. He's sitting at the Mount of Olives. First of all, understand Olive, okay? Olive is truth and peace. That's what Olive means. Truth and peace, oh, and love. Truth, peace, and love is what the word olive means in mysticism. The Mount of Olives is the higher realm of truth, peace, and love. That's where he always sits. He sits in the mountain within you in that higher realm where you ascend up to that mountain to touch truth, peace, and love. That's where he sits. So Jesus is sitting at the Mount of Olives. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Okay, what does this mean? You come in all by, remember on that Tuesday night I said, don't sit next to your friends, don't hold hands with your friends, don't smoochy, smoochy. You sit all by yourself, and what do you do? You go up to the mountain of truth, peace, and love to speak to the Christ. What you're doing is the same thing that Arjuna did in the Bhagavad Gita, you are saying, Oh Christ, come between the two warring parts of my being and speak to me and talk to me and explain to me. Give me confidence. Give me direction. Let me understand what this is all about. And here is that we bring the ultimate question, which can only be answered by the Christ in the higher place of truth, peace, and love. You cannot bring this question, which is the ultimate question of life. You cannot bring this question to anybody in the world except he who dwells within you at the mountain. Okay? And the question there is in Matthew 24, 3, when shall these things be? You've heard it all of your life. You've turned on television and had the pants scared out of you. Since you've been little kids, there have been people standing on street corners. When I used to be up in York, there's always somebody hawking things on the end of the world coming, coming in three weeks, it's all over, get it now, and they hand you a pamphlet, and then I'd sit there scared to death, I said to my mother, are you sure this guy doesn't know what he's talking about? I mean, the world's going to end next Tuesday, and I'm supposed to go to Olympic Park. There was a big amusement park in Irvington, New Jersey called Olympic Park, and I used to go up there all the time. I'm going, I want to go to Olympic Park Tuesday, this guy says the world's going to end. Is there anybody can do it Wednesday. You know, I mean, I re but to see, this was what it was. Every and they're still on, don't, aren't they on there? They don't do it with, they don't stand on street corners and work, now they got television. But they're hawking the same stuff. These are the end times. These are the last days. <laughs> that was a guy said 50 years ago when I wanted to go to Olympic Park, he said, still the last days, the end times. There's the last day. Do you know something? They call it the latter days. 
The word and the phrase latter days is Buddhist. Buddha Shakyamuni wrote what is called the Lotus Sutra of the latter day of the law. That was written close to a thousand years before Jesus, before these guys ever appeared on the scene. See? And that is talking of a strictly individual latter day within you. These are the last days, all right. But for that which has been the oppressor to be defiled and that which is Christ consciousness to be restored into you. Okay, let's take a look at this. What shall be, Matthew 24, verse 3, what, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Okay, now this is interesting. Isn't this great? Who's asking this question? The disciples. The guys who never showed up for the resurrection, they're asking him when the end of the world is going to come. He t eh? I mean, he told them about the resurrection. They didn't show up. They didn't believe him. So what are they asking him this for? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? I want you to look again. What shall be the sign of your coming? You see that? Let's take a look at that. Let's look at that word and put it here. What did they ask Jesus? What shall be the sign of your coming? Go to page one of your Bible in the Old Testament. Genesis, okay? Page one in your Bible. Now, it shouldn't take you a whole lot of time to find page one. <laughs> I shouldn't really have to stand around it too long. If you go to the cover, you've gone too far, okay? Genesis chapter 1, go to verse 14. Here's the creation of the stars. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs. What shall be the sign of your coming? And the Bible said, God created stars and said, let them be for signs. Let us take a star, or a group of stars called Aquarius. Okay? The age that you're entering into now. Okay? It is the man with the pitcher of water. The constellation Aquarius. It is a star, and as much as it is a star group, it qualifies for the first page of the Bible that says, let the stars be for signs. Does it not in your Bible say that? Say yes. See? You wouldn't think I made this up. This is true. Now, it says it in your Bible, the stars are created, let them be for signs. Inasmuch as Aquarius is a star, and inasmuch as Aquarius is the man with the pitcher of the water, it would qualify as a star and a sign. Right? Okay. Good. Let's go to page 83 in your little Bibles in the New Testament and go to the book of Luke, page 83, the book of Luke, and let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse 10. And what does Jesus say? And he said, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters. Okay? And in verse 12, he says, He shall show you a large upper room in your house. Okay? Furnished. In other words, you don't have to bring any of your furnishings with you, please. None of your old couches or old doilies or old soiled carpets or old beat up lamps. It's all furnished. Leave all of your junk home. Okay. There, make ready. What did he say? When you see the man with the pitcher of water, when you see the sign of Aquarius, enter within yourself. Go to the upper room, make ready, for I will come and I will be with you and we will eat and feast on the hidden map. What will be the sign? This is the dawning of the age of... That's the sign. The man with the pitcher of water. Who said so? How do I know? The Bible told me so. There you go. See what I'm saying to you? I didn't have to read this, you know, in the... 
you know, in the Fox's Eye, you know, the local uh, New Age newspaper that comes out of Hamilton, New Jersey, or anything like that. It's in the Bible. You know? It's in the Bible. The disciples wanted a sign. The Bible says stars are for sign. We looked at Aquarius as the age we're going into, and Jesus just happened to mention the man with a pitcher of water. Just happened to. Okay? Say, so, well, maybe there was a man carrying a pitcher of water. Men did not carry pitchers of water. Ladies carried pitchers of water. That was a disgrace for a man to carry a pitcher of water. And that's another reason why each one of you should run into the New Age and utterly bring every one of those stones crashing down of those edifices of discrimination because the reason... I read of, 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 saw on television the other day a woman neurosurgeon at a hospital, I think out in California or somewhere, or no, Sacramento or someplace, quit because she is treated, not because she's treated professionally any different, but she's looked down, she's not up to, you know, she's not a man. And so she is treated with less dignity than men. You know where it comes from? It's exactly where it comes from. It comes from the Bible where people have read literally instead of spiritually, and women have been discriminated against, people in, in different ethnic groups have been discriminated against. I tell you, you could go to the hot bed of Christianity in the United States, what they call the Bible Belt Down South, and even in 1991, a black person would not do well to walk into their holy halls. And so here then, we begin to see why this tremendous change, why is this change needed? Women's, what is the difference? Why shouldn't a woman neurosurgeon or a woman priest or whatever? What the heck is the difference? You know what the difference is? Superstition. Because this is what it said, and I read it literally. See? And yes, if you said to them, let's go shoot the bull, you better get out of the way, because they're going to get a gun, because they read everything literally. And do you know... And I'm telling you something. Do you know why women all over the country, all of this isn't just Christianity now. I'm talking about religion. You go over in some of those places where they just sent the guys to fight over there, and it's a hundred times worse. They've got to have a thing over their face, and they can't, they can't even get a driver's license. It all comes out of the same ancient superstitions of religion. It all comes out of literalism of the Bible. And it's a horror story. And people perpetuate it. And it's the main line. Let's continue this. Let's sing Amazing Grace, you know. But as long as, that, and it, but as, long as the women sit over here and the men sit over there, oh, we're going to have the men's clubs and the women's clubs. I hate that, men's club. We'll have a people club. Men's club, women's club. It is. We're going to have a men's breakfast. We're going to serve eggs. They always called me up. I'm come to the men's breakfast. I'm going to come to no men's breakfast. Are you going to have any women there? No, well, I ain't going. <laughs> Plus, I wouldn't go anyhow because I wouldn't eat eggs. I can't even be near those things. <laughs> Men's breakfast. Why don't they have lunch? Getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning and getting religious. How can you get religious at 6 o'clock in the morning over eggs? <laughs> okay. So here then we have the understanding of that that sign. When shall these, what shall be the coming? Lights in the heavens, the stars, the age of Aquarius, when you meet a man with the pitcher of water. And look at what it says here in verse 14 of Luke 22 where we were. And when the hour was come, he sat down with the 12 apostles. I don't have my physics book or Albert's physiology book or anything like that. But when he sits down with the 12 apostles, if you look at the human brain, there were six aspects on the left side and six aspects on the right side. You have, everything is in 12. When he sits down within you and eats and consumes and pours forth unto you that which is this, this, this Passover, celebrating this cinema, it's tremendous. Now look at Matthew 24. Let's go back to where we were. Matthew 24 and verse 4, page 25 in your little Bibles. And Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. In other words, the answer for your life, the direction for your life, cannot come from any human being. It can't. Because no matter what that person tells you, if you don't believe it, you don't believe it. It may be the 
gospel truth. If you don't believe it, it's a lie. It may be a lie. If you believe it, it's the truth. And so let no man teach you. Let no man tell you. Let no man, let no woman direct you. Follow nobody but that divine principle that is within yourself. And why is this so important? It's because you're living in the time that Christ prophesied. The man with the pitcher of water right now, you can enter in, go to the upper room and find him there just as he promised you. And that's where the direction from your life will come. That's where it'll come from. It'll come out of the divine nothingness, that nirvana, that bliss, that holy place within yourself that will give you direction and that will give you understanding. Page 220 in your little Bibles, and the rest of you go to the book of 1 John. 220, uh, 1 John, and we'll go to chapter 2. I just want to remind you as you're looking for that again, that as many as you as have missed that teachings on Buddha last time, you should come and should be part of it. It is the most magnificent psychology. I mean, you run a psychiatrist, psychologist, and counselors. The premier guy who ever lived that knew that stuff lived 2,000, 3,000 years ago, a guy named Shakyamuni Buddha. And we'll get back on his teachings tonight. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. And what does it say? The anointing. That means that touch in your consciousness of that Holy Spirit, which you have received of him, abides, dwells where? in you and you need not that any man teach you but as the anointing teaches you it's truth and is no lie and even as it has taught you you shall abide in him you don't need people to talk for God's sakes there's everybody it's even getting that way in New Age you get the New Age journal Every page, there's 500 people. They all got the answer. Use this kind of stone. No, use this magic stick. Chant this, chant that. Listen to this. Put these things on your head and blow, it'll blow you into outer spaces. Everybody's got a gimmick. Everybody has got a gimmick. Whether it's a religious gimmick or a new age gimmick, it doesn't make any difference. Sister Rose is going to tell you this. Brother Charlie's going to tell you that. There's an Indian going to tell you this. There's a guy from Mexico is going to tell you that. This guy's got this a magic potion here. This is another... Here you can't go to Nirvana unless you got these electric earphones and you put these as a blast you right out. Don't be warning, don't use these while you're driving a car. All this kind of stuff. <laughs> and yet, what do you hold it? It's the same thing. It's just another variation of the theme. So you have to then find this kingdom within you. And that's where the power and that's where the stone comes from. Okay? For where meditation comes from. Now let's go to Matthew 24 again, real quick. Page 25 in the little Bible is where we're at here. Matthew 24, verse 5. Matthew 24, verse number 5. And Jesus says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. How do they do that? I'll tell you how they do it. It's very simple. And you see it all the time. And you've, you've all experienced. I had a word from the Lord for you. Did you ever get anybody to tell you that? The Lord gave me a word for you. Look out. Look out. Put it in B for boogie and get out of there. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I, I learned from a fella that we know years ago in the gospel music business, and these, all these gospel groups, come up, they all wanted to get a contract with Word Records. Ah, Mr. Nora Cross. Yeah, I sat with him. I saw that. Well, the Lord spoke to my heart today and told me that I should speak to you about this new singing group we got here. We're singing this new song, Jesus is coming on a rocket ship. <laughs> and, and Mr. Noah Cross, that uh, Jesus is coming on a rocket ship is supposed to go to the top of all the charts. And God said that is on, I, he, we should speak to you about getting a record contract. I'm telling you, this is the, exactly what goes on. And he looked at him, he says, you know, he never mentioned a word of it to me. <laughs> and I always learned a lesson from that. If God's got something to tell you, he'll tell you. <laughs> Not going to tell them half wit coming up. Uh, I got, you ever see these people are all in osmosis. Oh, the Lord gave me a word for you. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Well, this is exactly what Jesus said is going to happen. They're going to come around and say, you know, God told me to tell you this. 
Now that's the one where they can tell you something about, you know, you, you know, you might smell a little bit, nobody wants to offend you. That's oh boy, oh God told me to tell you. You know, there is a an aura coming from you. <laughs> There's an aura coming from you. <laughs> For many shall come in mind, if you do this, you know, everybody's got a way to reach the realms of power. <laughs> and I do too. But it's not my way. It's the way that you, I just say, obey Jesus Christ and don't pay any attention to anybody else. The kingdom is within you. Seek it. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Cast your energy to the right side. It works. It really does work, okay? The <laughs> There is, you know, like I said, there, nowadays there's many people in, 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 in the New Age that are got all the astrologists, they fool many people, occult people and psychic people and all of this kind of stuff. But the one who gives the instruction to the single eye in the kingdom within is Jesus. As he said, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Now, look at Matthew 24, verse 6, and this is where we'll uh, put it to an end. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know, this is the thing that the community, the religious community dwells on. Every time anybody fires a cap pistol anywhere in the middle, this is it. You know, you, did you see it when, the, when this war started? Well, God's schedule's right on plan. They all had maps, you remember? They all had a big map. Now, this is where they're going to be coming. And this fulfills the prophecy of Ezekiel 67. And, uh, you know, right, God's right. It's never stopped. It never will stop. There's a war. It's always going. He's not talking about the wars on the outside. He's talking about the wars on the inside. You who come here on Friday night, you have sat here for three weeks. And what have you listened to in the... The Bhagavad Gita, you have listened to the preparation for war. The forces of the sons of Pandu, the divine spirit, going against the forces of the blind king, the carnal mind, the wars. And all of the rumors of wars are simply that which is within you, and the indecision, and the hostility, and the feelings of anger, and the need to try to control yourself. And it rages on within your head, constantly rages. Constantly there's a battle going on. Constantly, every single day you wake up and you go, oh, I'm sick of this. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. Why am I doing this? I want to get on a train or a plane. Get the heck out of here somewhere. All of this rages within inside of yourself. And somebody that you live with says something, and it freaks you out, and you're just ready to go to the ah! Scream and wars are raging. Wars are raging. And you've got to understand in this Matthew 24, in this Bible, it's talking about what goes on inside of your head. There is no need for you to worry about anything going on anyplace else. It's irrelevant to you. It's what's going on. The only thing that matters to you, and if you're honest, you'll admit it, is what goes on right smack in here and what it tells you is important. Otherwise, it's, it's just meaningless. What was, the, what was the question in the beginning of this thing? The sign of your coming. When will these things happen? The sign of your coming. The rumors of wars. The sign of your coming where? The sign of his coming to you. Not the sign of his coming coming on a white horse over Kennedy Airport and all this hullabaloo. It's the sign. What will be the change in your life as you start to feel this impulse awakening within you? What is it going to feel like? What is going to happen within you? What will, how will he overcome the turmoil? What will go on within your mind? This is all this is about. It's not talking about a literal Jesus coming through the sky back to the United States. Or to, it's talking about what is the sign that he is starting to erupt into life within you? What is the sign? The lower nature starts rising against the higher nature. Brother, you could say, uh, you know, we got the weather and so there's not as many here, but I mean, uh, some summertime. But I mean, you could see it in this place. You could see that people come in and they're affected by this thing and they're lifted up by this thing and they're like Arjuna and they're like the sons of Pandu. They're given all of this property and oh, they're so happy. But all of a sudden, that Duradana, that, that lower desire, the sons of the blind can come and there's a turmoil goes on and you don't see anybody. Because of that same conflict, and each one of us goes through that. I go through the conflict. You go through the conflict. 
And this is what bothers me. You see these guys standing up on television and they're all preaching and everything as if there's nothing ever happens to them wrong. You see? Comes off television and he's in his room somewhere, he's back home, and he's, he's putting his fist through the wall. <laughs> Screaming, you know, within himself, the rage is that if we'll just admit it, we'll be able to deal with it. And this is what Jesus is talking about. You're going to have this happen. You're going to enter within yourself. You're going to do some meditation. You're going to start, you know, and even sometimes you'll feel things are getting worse since I'm meditating. You know what Buddha said about that? It's not that things are getting worse. You've been living in a cesspool all of your life, and now you're just getting your sense of smell back. And you're saying, this ain't the way I want to live. I want to get out of here. This is not unlike the prodigal son. But that's your mind. Your mind will whisper to you. Mine does all the time. I'm telling you, I mean all the time. So if somebody comes here, they don't come, they don't come next week or the week after. I figure, uh oh, what did I say? What did I I'm on a guilt trip? Jesus says, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged because when the lower and the higher start to come and do combat, there will rage within you until finally that beast is overcome, until finally that beast is destroyed. Don't you be discouraged. And just understand, and I'm not, I could name everybody sitting in these chairs. I'm not going to name everybody sitting in these chairs, but I'll just point to everybody, and including myself, and say, if you've got a wild beast raging in you, you can look around at each other right now and know you've got good company because there's a beast raging within every person sitting in this room. And it's the same beast, the same problem. Don't think you're failing. Don't think you're losing. As Jesus says, this has to happen. You know why? Because here's your lower nature. Oh, I did this wrong. <laughs> there is your lower groveling nature. And your lower nature is being attacked from above. These are doves. There's a war. Your lower nature is being, and your lower nature is fighting back. But one day, you will overcome, and the horror of the lower nature will be turned upside down. Amazing, somebody said. <laughs> My name was Grace. They called me Amazing Grace. <laughs> and so that's what's going to happen to you. Not because of anything you can do about it, but simply because you're willing to subject yourself to that which is the Christ power and unleash it. But your lower mind will not give up without a fight. And as we wrap this up today in Matthew 24, 6, Jesus says, <laughs> For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In other words, he's saying it's just the first step in your battle against that which you've been, you know, you've, we've all let that beast or whatever you want to call it have a pretty good foothold. I mean, there, there's, there's a few young ones here that are lucky, but most of us have allowed that old snake to be winding its way and laying its eggs for a lot of years. And now all of a sudden, when we're up to our neck and you know what in this cesspool, we say, I want to get out of here. And you just can't step out. It's a fight. But boy, as you go along in Matthew 24 and you begin to understand it, you're going to see the good stuff happen. You're going to know, you're going to know about the abomination. Did you ever hear about the abomination of desolation? Did you, any of you ever hear of that? Oh, that's good. Well, then they haven't filled your eyes with a lot of stuff because that's, uh, that's a big thing. That's, that's, the anti that's, the, that's, the, that's, that's the Antichrist. That's what they're all waiting for to see, the abomination of desolation. Standing in the holy place. What in the world are you doing with that zipper? <laughs> good thing you don't have dungarees on. <laughs> the abomination of desolation. 
That is the thing that says in the, in the book of, um, of Daniel and all of these, the Antichrist, okay? What is the abomination? I'll tell you right what it is so you, you, can, you can figure out how, how this is going to go and that you, everything's going to come out good. The abomination of desolation according to religion is this horrible person that's going to stand in the temple. No. What is an abomination? Ah, something horrible, okay? What is the temple? Your consciousness. What is desolation? Barrenness. Barrenness. When you finally come to realize the horror that the right hemisphere of your brain is desolate, then will Christ come. Huh? When you finally realize the horrible condition, abomination, that your higher mind, the right side, is desolate, then will the Christ come. This Matthew 24 that they've all been horrified about is a magnificent song of hope and creation for each one of you. Okay, thank you very much.